Lives. And as we wait for the world to be transformed, the God of love is already here, changing us from within. We are here for love to come alive. reading from the book of Mark. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ's love and forgiveness. May the word sent from God through the prophets lead us to the way of salvation.
Good morning and welcome everyone to worship. I'm Billy Dalton and I'm the servant leader pastor here at Millwood United Methodist Church in Kalamazoo, Michigan. This pandemic has made it harder for all of us to stay connected with each other. And one thing we can do to help the church family is to leave a comment on the side of the video this morning. If you've checked in and you're watching, greet somebody, uh, say hello, acknowledge the service. Carl always loves somebody to say hello to him, so take time to do that. And, and we can know who came. Even if they're visitors, please note that you're viewing for the first time. It helps us to make sure that regular attenders aren't slipping through the cracks, and I know I always love seeing who's worshiping together on Sunday mornings. And after doing that, grab yourself a cup of beverage, settle into a favorite spot, and let's join together in this time of renewing our hearts, reconnecting, and finding love with our community, our beloved community. We are about to enter in to two weeks of service here at Millwood. Not only is the pantry operational, but we also have an open house tomorrow, the, 15th, the 14th of December, and Wednesday, the 14th, so that you can come in um, and view the fresh scene, the manger scene that's always been out in the lobby since I've been here, but we moved it inside. So everyone come and meditate, look at the beauty of it, and the art of it, and the inspiration of it, and take the opportunity to start this couple of weeks. Though skies burn red and hopes turn gray, though heaven and earth will pass away, the God who brought us safe thus far still guides us with a shining star. You sing a new song in the night and lead us to the holy light. We hear the angels call his name and no will never be the same and no will never be the same a voice cries out prepare the way the age of peace begins today when healing springs up from the ground Forgiveness grows and faith is found. You sing a new song in the night and lead us to the holy light. We hear the angels call his name and no will never be the same and no The joy of all the world is here With news to drive away our fear Fling wide the gate and prison door Come heal your heart and grieve no more You sing a new song in the night And lead us to the holy light We hear the angels call his name and no will never be the same and no will never be the same for using that song and it's growing on us uh, Caleb does a great rendition of it and uh, the words just really cut through to our hearts uh, it's been, in a way, a troublesome 24 hours since I found out that Reverend Philip Steele passed away, knowing how long his service was at this place. And also the other folks I've heard about and the struggles they're having in tending 
the people they love. And we need to remember these families as we go and not be hesitant to do it because things are happening in our families. By the way, um, Reverend Steele uh, passed away from natural causes, so that you know. And he was very, very active where he was for months and months and months. And when Jennifer called, uh, they're probably going to have a service sometime in the summer, not right now. So be ready for that when you begin to hear about his passing. The other thing that uh, Never Be the Same does is lead us into a time of, of prayer. It gives us all kinds of images to, to listen to. The voices of this season are so great if we listen to them. The voice of the angels, the, uh, the voice of the prophets, the voice of John the Baptist, the voice of so many characters around us, the voice of a nurse who is exhausted from, from her work, the voice of a lawyer who's been struggling for years and years, the voice of those who desire to make the season a different kind of season, a penitential season where we find out where God is in, in all this mix and what God's calling us to do. What an opportunity in prayer to find where our quiet place is. Let's take a moment, and where everybody is this morning, wherever that sacred place is, let's open ourselves to the presence of God's Spirit and do some deep breathing for a moment. Take it in and hold it for a count of five. And breathe it out. Take it in. Take it in. In the depths of our hearts, O oh God, we listen for your voice in so many, many places. We know that your voice and the spirit of your healing will touch us in this season. We pray, O oh God, that you find us opening our hearts to the places where love is in our neighbor, in our family, among those who, who give us medical care, and among those who represent us, and among those who are directly around us, our neighbor, the clerk at the store, the clerk at the gas station, all those people, the police officers, the nurses, the teachers, and the students. Your voice is everywhere. Your voice comes at a time when we are rejoicing. We are rejoicing for what Pfizer and the other companies have done. We are rejoicing because today is the day that we are aware that all of it's on the move and we're going to sense it more and more as time passes, as things begin to change. Our lives have changed in this pandemic and they're going to change further. Oh God, my, I pray that you find us continuing to wear our mask in public, wherever people are, and that we maintain the social distance, the holy distance that you want us to maintain. We pray for all those who are struggling this day, and we pray that for all those captives who that hear the good news proclaimed, for all those who are liberated today, oh God, we give you thanks that in our sin you find us, all of us, not just some of us. And that is there where the forgiveness begins.
It is there where we're penitent. It is there where we begin to hear your voice over and over and over again. Love one another as I have loved you. We thank you for this day, and we thank you for Jesus Christ and for all the teachings that he gave us. We especially thank you for the one that he taught us, his disciples, to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, everybody, pose for the picture. Say cheese. Three, two, one. Got it. Okay, I'm not sure that's how cameras work, but I love taking pictures. I love taking them. I love looking at them. I love sending them to my friends and family. Pictures are great. And another word for pictures is images. You hear that word sometimes, images. Well, images is also a word that comes up in the Bible. It says that we, all people, are made in God's image. Wow. What do, it's like someone saw God and took a picture and we're what came out. You know, I like to think of that because sometimes I don't feel good about myself and I think, oh, I stink. But then I remember God is amazing and I have a lot of that amazingness in me. And the same is true about you. You are made in the image of God. So if God is loving and all-powerful, then you are loving and you have power too. So this week, I want you to go out there and remember that you and everyone you meet is made in the image of God. All right, let's try it again. Cheese. See you next week. Some words from the book of Isaiah, near the end of the book, hear these words that are written in a prophetic style. The Lord God's Spirit is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives, and liberation for prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and a day of vindication for our God. Comfort all who mourn, to provide for Zion's mourners, to, to give them a crown in place of ashes, oil of joy in place of mourning, a mantle of praise in place of discouragement. They will be called oaks of righteousness. Planted by the Lord to glorify himself, they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore formerly deserted places. They will renew ruined cities and places deserted for generations past. I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and dishonesty. I will faithfully give them their wage and make with them an enduring covenant. Their offspring will be known among the nations and their descendants among the peoples. All who see them will recognize that they are a people blessed by the Lord. I surely rejoice in the Lord. My heart is joyful because of my God, because he has clothed me with the clothes of victory, wrapped me in a robe of righteousness like a bridegroom in a priestly crown, and like a bride adorned in jewelry. As the earth puts out its growth, and as a garden grows its seeds, so the Lord will grow righteousness and praise before all the nations.
this reading from the third portion of Isaiah, the third Isaiah, if you will, is very, very important to us. Can you imagine losing the best and the brightest people in our culture? They would just disappear. And they would watch their, their churches crumble to the ground, temples in ruin, an entire life around their city being destroyed, being separated from their families, and being sent to Babylon in an exile for a long time, so long that the original people who were sent are no longer alive, and the new people who are coming out of exile are having to figure out how to go forward, and Isaiah begins to speak for the third time. We don't know who Isaiah is speaking to, but we know that he is speaking to us. A prophet emerges in every age if we're willing to listen. And this prophet has emerged in every age through all kinds of people. And every time calls out the justice of God as a form of God's passion. If we hear it in that way, then we hear that our waiting in this third week, our waiting and, and focusing on love is focusing on what YHWH, Yahweh God, is doing in the universe. To hear it any other way is to misread this. Because if you will remember, everyone who is listening, if everyone can remember at the beginning of, of Jesus' ministry on this earth, what did he quote? He quoted Isaiah 61. I've been anointed. And he quoted, he knew this passage. He knew that this was applicable to the Messiah, to the Messiah. And Jesus was claiming that mantle. What is it that he was claiming? It's important for us to know that when the Isaiah writer, when the Isaiah prophet begins to speak, he says that the Lord God's Spirit is upon me. In other words, he's sensing God's passion. God's passion's all around him. He looks at the temple in ruins. He looks at the city. And how are we going to rebuild this? How are we going to put our lives back together now? And he begins, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Now the word anoint has always been that a king, someone who's a, in high power, was being anointed. But here, we cannot hear it that way. When he says the Lord has anointed me, he's talking about a servant. He's appointed, God has anointed me to be servant. And to serve here. And what is it that he, he's been anointed to serve where? To do what? Where is this message coming from and to whom? We know it's coming from someone who knows Isaiah and who is a prophet representing Isaiah. Who's listening? You and I are listening. All of us are the listeners to bring good news to the poor. It does mean economic poverty. There's no question about it. Because of nothing else in our culture, the poor need good news. It's hard right now. It's frustrating right now. In this pandemic, in this desert, those who are poor economically are flat out having the struggle of their lives just to exist from one day to another. To feed self is, ch is a challenge. To pay any other bills is unbelievable. We see them all the time in the work and ministry we do. We see our brothers and our sisters who are those people who, who are on the margins looking for food but looking for 
all kinds of other relief. But hearing the good news of what God is, a, is going to do and is doing. But understand that when we get over into Matthew and in the Sermon on the Mount, we, we hear it differently. It, there's a, a poor in spirit. Our entire population is poor in spirit. All of us are. He came to proclaim the news to the poor. You and I are the poor now. All of us are the poor. He came to bind up the brokenhearted. A couple, couple of weeks ago, I was in a, a workshop, a Zoomed workshop, with a whole lot of other pastors. One of the speakers that morning was a young woman who was talking about the work she was doing in the COVID clinic where she is. And she says, I, for the last seven months, have known nothing but exhaustion, day after day after day. And I hold the hands of people who cannot even see their families as their life passes in front of us both. And she said, I... I had this man one night who was running a real high fever. And the doctor came through and said, pack him in ice. And so I began to get all the available ice in the unit to pack his body in, in, in ice so that his fever would go down. There wasn't very much ice, so I began to take cold cloths and just rub his arms and rub his head and to rub his chest, trying to get his fever down. And finally, they brought me all the ice. And I said to him, you do the breathing, leave the rest up to me. You do the breathing, leave the rest up to me. That was a long night for her. That was a long shift for her as she constantly monitored how he was doing. And in the morning when she left, she looked to see they were removing the ice. The fever of his body had broken, and he had gone through the night. I couldn't help but be moved. I think God's voice is in everyone. And that morning, all I could hear was, you do the breathing, and I'll do the rest. That's God's voice to us. George Floyd, six months ago, said, I can't breathe. If they'd gotten up off of him and let him breathe, his death probably would not have occurred. Because breath is the essence of life. Breath is the presence of God. And this nurse says, you do the breathing, leave the rest to me. And maybe that's what we need to do when we bind up the brokenhearted. We are brokenhearted. Heart means, from the Scripture's perspective, it means the very soul that we have. If anyone listening has ever been brokenhearted, I have, I have to recover when my heart's broken. I know when my soul has been penetrated. I know when it hurts over something that can't possibly seem to be repaired in human behavior or in human relationship with family, with neighbors, with friends, with enemies, all throughout my life. And I know all of us to be that way, that sometimes we're just flat out sad. We're sad about things. And we have to recover. Isaiah says, the good news is that God is going to bind up the brokenhearted. In other words, make it right. Make it whole again. God loves us that much. God's passion is so great that broken hearts are going to be mended. And then, the Lord's Spirit's upon me because YHWA God has sent me to proclaim release for the captives and the liberation of prisoners. The release of, the, of captives. I dare say 
that if we start to define what sin is, it means that we have been distanced from God. We are distanced from God. We want to define sin, it's not very far away. Anytime there's an addiction, we have distanced ourselves from God. And the old term is, and our hearts are hard. We are captive to a lot of things. Today, this third Sunday in Advent, we have the opportunity, because of God's passion, for us to look at all those places that we are bound to, that we are captive to, and see where God will release us, where we can be released. All of us do it. All of us. No one's exempt. I've been, I've been reading the work called Searching for Justice by Brian Stevenson. And someone listening to me, I hope you've been paying attention to this man. He's been around for a bit. I want to tell the story of when he got out of Harvard Law School. That's a good place to start with Brian Stevenson. Because he got out of law school and he went to practice with a firm, and he was instructed as a defender, he said, will you go up to the prison and tell the man who's on death row that his execution has been stayed until next week? It makes this power, this story gets more powerful considering that we've had two executions in this country in the last couple of weeks. And the possibility of having Four more in the next month is hideous. That we would still be doing that. But Brian had never done this before. He was just a young lawyer, a law student at the time. He is not completely trained. And they sent him up there to tell him that this man's execution had been stayed. And he he called him out and they sat down and he said, he said, I, I, I'm just a law student. I, I don't know how to tell you this. Your execution next week, your execution is now stayed and it won't be next week. We don't know when it will be, but it will be not next week. And the man got up and took him by the shoulders. What did you say? What? Did you say? Brian goes, I'm just a law student. Don't hurt me. Your execution has been stayed. And the man said, Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And God will lead me on higher ground. He burst open with song. He couldn't help it. And that was Brian's first contact with a child who had been sentenced to death. Because of why? Now, 30 years later, Brian has been doing nothing but advocating for children who have been given adult sentences and who will grow up in prison. He's been fighting for their right to say, you don't want children to smoke. You don't want them to drink. How would you like for them to spend their developmental years in prison and that only and never give them a chance to become fully human? Brian has fought for and gotten the release of children who were able to grow up and get them whole again. It's that kind of captivity. It's, letting the, it's releasing those that are innocent those who have not become fully developed yet. If you listen to Brian, he is such an ardent advocate that in Alabama where the memorial is for those who have died, he's now the executive director of that. He traveled there and got that job. Many times, Brian has never been compensated for anything he's done. It's a lifelong passion. Look him up. 
Brian Stevenson. He's worth a read. And the Lord has also sent him to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and a day of vindication for our God. The Lord's favor, the year of Jubilee, is usually every 50 years. But it's the freedom from debt. The debt load of the United States, of the citizens of the United States, is astronomical. It's amazing how much debt our country carries. And on Jubilee year, all debts are forgiven. And to comfort all who mourn in a day of vindication. In other words, there's a day of forgiveness, a day for those who are mourning to be healed, and a mantle of praise. We're going to be covered by a mantle of praise in place of discouragement. How much discouraging do we hear right now? How much toxic words have we been listening to as citizens of this country? How much toxicity do we allow into our personalities? And it has an effect on us. We are quarantined. We can't go do what we were able to do before. Life is not the normal that we had. We don't know how it's going to be, but we're looking forward to whatever it is. We're going to make it the best we can because what God has done for us to get us through this. It's a day of rejoicing. It's a day, Galdate is a day of rejoicing for God's passion is at work. Love is radically lived out according to this prophet. Keep breathing. Let me do the rest. Keep breathing. Let me do the rest. Someone say amen, and I will be quiet. Okay, I heard that. So many wonderful things are happening around our place in the next couple of weeks. If you were to drive by right now, you'd see a star up on top of one of the big trees out there. When I came in this morning in the darkness, that star just shone so bright. During the day, it's not as bright, but it's still there. That's going to stand over where the nativity is in a couple of weeks, or this week, at the end of this week, on the 18th and 19th. Everyone's going to be able to drive up and see the living nativity and pet the llamas and the camels and the donkeys and whatever else is there. It's a, a great time. It's a part of the ministry of this place. The pantry's still working, and we're having a large number of people come through. We've done um, the gifting for Christmas already for the Head Start children and their families. That's now completed. What an opportunity to listen to the voice of God in all those places. It's been a real joy to do that. Don't forget to take time during this period of time to give that best gift anybody can give. As we go forward, we're going to have a long day's night service next Sunday night that's a part of a, a covenant group of, of Methodist ministers, United Methodist ministers, that Caleb and I are connected to and they're colleagues of ours. That'll be next Sunday night. And then that following week on, on Thursday night is caroling in the neighborhood. And on Friday, Christmas Eve, be a virtual service running all day. That's music and scriptures. And then that night, we're going to invite everybody to come in on the parking lot and be a part of a, a very short Christmas Eve service that includes candle lighting and scripture and silent night. Everybody please come. Everybody take
time to find this gift that God is giving us in everything that's going on. Take the time and come and do it. Everyone's welcome. Listen to Carl every Sunday morning and Deacon Caleb to, Caleb to do the leadership that he does. And we're grateful to Sarah and Catherine Carter for their participation this morning. It's always a blessing to have them come and their ministry together. And this tech staff uh, is, an, is amazing. They stick with it and stick with it and stick with it until we get it right. Even if we've gotten it wrong, we'll get it right. Hang with us. We're going forward. And I give thanks for all those people we've named. If you have a chance, thank Scott Snyder for putting the star up outside. He's uh, done a good work this week. I appreciate Kevin West's ministry and his music. He always comes through in a way that speaks to me, and I enjoy him as a person, and I enjoy him a lot when he sings. It always means something for me. O oh God of living, please use our gifts, not just to keep the lights on, but to shine a light into this neighborhood, this community, this world that's sick of the darkness and find us willing to express joy and rejoice with each other. Now we accept your love. Amen. Now let us join in singing the last hymn.
the year. In benedictions, I'm always going, go, do, I send you at the benediction. But not during Advent this year. I haven't been able to do that so much. Because what I'm trying to do is encourage all of us to step into this penitential season as we begin to welcome Messiah, Messiah, Jesus Christ, the love of God into our lives. All the scripture is leaning in that direction. It's like all of us are leaning over in expectation of God's love coming in Jesus Christ. The only question is, what would we do if we welcomed it into our hearts, into our souls, into our lives, and were it, became it, became that same love to others that we've been shown? This is the challenge of the week. Might all of us accept it and be grateful.